light switches, cars, vim. What do they have in common? State. More specifically, they have distinct states and rules for moving between them. Once you see the world as a collection of state machines, it'll be hard to go back. My name is Christian, and I'm a software engineer with a fondness for Elixir. Let's walk through what state machines are, how to model them, and why the Ash framework excels at the task. As always, code is available with a link in the description. Now, back in college, I remember the first time state machines were introduced, sophomore year. The professor asked how we would write a program representing a traffic light. Some students chose to represent each color as a Boolean, on or off. And you might laugh at this choice, but looking at some people's React code these days, the instinct to make it more complicated is alive and well. But there's obviously a better way. Create a state variable with three possible values, red, yellow, and green. But why is it better? Well, first off, it protects us from impossible states. If you approached a light and it was both green and red, what would that mean? It's also more maintainable. As every software engineer knows, requirements change. Your product manager isn't lying on purpose, but they rarely give the full picture. It's our responsibility to build software that can easily meet future needs. Late at night, traffic lights enter a mode with a flashing red light, acting like a stop sign. If we only had three Booleans, how would we know whether a light is red because it's in the middle of flashing or because it's a genuine stop? We add another Boolean? No thanks. Instead, we could add new possible state values, something like flash red on and flash red off. The same approach scales to things much more complicated than a traffic light, but the underlying premise is the same. If you have a specific set of states and can define the valid transitions between them, you might have a finite state machine. Let's extend this idea to something more practical. After all, the traffic light industry is pretty small, but e-commerce is huge. Introducing Money Pit. Like every app these days, we have a pro plan and a max plan. And with a single click, we'll gladly take your money. Maybe you're good for it, or maybe the payment will fail. Now, orders have three states, placed, paid, and failed. And this demo is built in Phoenix and Ash. In case you're not up to speed on Ash, here's four quick things that you need to know. Ash doesn't replace Phoenix or Ecto. Instead, it's a framework that makes it easier to build and maintain Phoenix apps. Focus on your core domain and leave out the boring, repetitive glue code. Second, everything in Ash is a resource, each of which live in a domain and contain actions. Third, there are a ton of extensions that give extra capabilities to Ash resources. Things like Ash AI, Ash Archive, and what I'll show you today, Ash State Machine. And the fourth thing, even though Ash has DSLs for most situations, there's always an escape hatch. It won't come up in this project, but it's important to keep in mind. With all of that in mind, let's walk through the two resources in the demo app's commerce domain. We'll take a look at the product first. Products have a name and a price, and well, hopefully they have a bunch of orders. On the policy side, only admins can create products, but everyone can see the products. And because this is a simple CRUD example, the actions are just defaults, read and create. And this little thing just says that you can set all of the properties. Now over in the domain module, I've defined a code interface. So create product, list products, and get product by ID are all going to be exposed at the domain level. This is similar to the context modules you'll find in most Phoenix apps, but it's a little bit more powerful and a little bit more simple. So over in the storefront, when we want to load all the products, we just say list all of the products. And by the way, this is the user that I am. And when we make a purchase, we run commerce.purchase product. We say what ID we're buying and we pass our actor, the current user. If it succeeds, we redirect over to that order, like you saw before, and if it fails, we'll tell you that it failed. When a user purchases a product, they're executing an action on the order resource, which we'll look at next. For attributes, orders have an amount, how much was spent, they have some timestamps, they belong to a user, and for right now, they only purchase one product per order, so there's a simple belongs to relationship there. 
but at the core is the state attribute. Created, paid, failed, and a couple more we'll get to later. When the user purchases a product, the order gets a default value of created. And later, when we actually process that payment, we run the process payment action, naturally, which, well, what's a demo without a little simulated sleep and failure after all, will end up 90% of the time succeeding and 10% of the time failing. We're changing that state attribute to one value or another. Now, in the real world, maybe this would be a reactor. But for right now, we're just going to sleep for some random amount of time and determine if it succeeds or not. We're not taking your money today. Now, let's extend our requirements. Maybe, because we have some orders done here, somebody ended up ordering twice or needs a refund for some reason. Well, admin users, which I signed into one in dark mode over here, have the ability to issue a refund. So if I hit this refund button, the refund has been approved, it is pending, and it'll be processed in the background on some schedule according to our business rules. When I click that button, what's happening behind the scenes is we're running this refund action. It just sets the state to ready for refund. Maybe we would also want to add this to an audit log or something, but let's keep it simple. We don't want users to approve their own refunds, something that's easily represented as a policy. If I go to the policies section here, I can see that everybody can see their own orders and admins can see every order and only admins can run the refund action. So over in the orders table, I added a conditional. This refund button only shows up if the user can refund an order. This can function was automatically added to the code interface when I added the line refund order down here and defined that this function exists. So you get a can function that'll tell you if you can do it. You get functions that allow you to execute. This is one of the big benefits of the Ash framework. Now, this is fine, but it's pretty messy. The rules about which states can transition into other states aren't explicitly defined. They just kind of exist across all of these different actions. And it would be really easy to introduce a bug where maybe a refunded order gets refunded more than once. For this, I recommend using Ash State Machine. After installing it as a dependency, it's easy to use the Ash State Machine extension. First, you register it as an extension at the top of your resource module. Then you define a state machine block. What states are valid as starting points? What state should we start with if none is specified? And what transitions can each action perform? For example, process payment is only valid on created orders and might move to paid or failed. We can only refund paid orders and so on. Then instead of set attribute, we use transition state. Internally, validations will run to make sure we aren't violating any of our transition rules. And since the state attribute is being defined by the state machine declaration, we can remove the attribute. By default, it'll be an atom value named state. How convenient. Okay, so we refactored it. Now what? Well, now there's a single place where all the transitions are defined and where all of the states are defined. Also, this can be turned into a diagram for documentation with the ash state machine generate flowcharts command. It can output in PNG and Mermaid. Opening up that file, here's a real flowchart of the states directly from the code of this resource. Now, there's still one more bug in our app. The refund button still shows up when it shouldn't. If I click refund on a refunded order, well, I'm gonna get an error, it'll get rejected, it's not gonna be the end of the world, but it's still bad form and it's a bit confusing. But here's where Ash really shines. Since all of the packages are designed to work together, we can do something like this. If I go into the policies of the order resource, I can just add one little line here and say, the refund shouldn't be allowed unless that would be a valid state in the state machine. Adding that one single line clears up the bug in our orders table. We only see the refund button in a situation where we'd actually be able to press it and it would succeed right here. 
Think about what it would take to add that with another approach and how hard it would be to keep that in sync with your state rules as they evolve over time. Instead, it's just reading that declaration of the state machine and making that judgment at runtime. Now, we could stop there, but I wanted to show you a few more things that Ash did behind the scenes in this project. Down in our attributes, I defined the amount as money. The Ash money package lets you declare monetary attributes and operate on them with currency code and proper decimal support. To keep the page up to date, I use the built-in pub sub mechanism, which allows you to define topic templates for broadcasting. So when we make a purchase, messages end up on this created topic. And whenever I update an order, whether it's through the backend or through the user's action, or maybe through an admin, it will be published on a few other topics. Subscribing to these events is just standard live view. In my orders page, I just say subscribe to created orders and updated orders if we're an admin. And if we're a regular user, let's subscribe to them with a user scope. And finally, the Ash Obon package was used to process payments and refunds in the background. Since we want payments to run as soon as possible, the purchase product action runs the Obon trigger process payment. This throws it onto a queue and a worker will run that process payment action because of this trigger declaration. So we're triggering an Obon job, which will run the Ash action on the resource process payment and it's not going to be scheduled automatically. It's only going to run on the fly. And finally, there's a guard that says only run this if the state is created. As for our refunds, they run on a cron that looks for all orders that are ready for a refund. So we're looking for anything ready for refund and we'll run that perform refund action. By default, this happens every minute, but in reality, you might want to do this toward the end of the business day or whatever your business needs. So all of these packages are built around the core Ash abstractions, domains, resources, and actions, along with changes and policies. And ultimately, they become greater than the sum of their parts. Until next time, this has been Code and Stuff. Thanks for watching.